So I am the systems convener for a global action and learning network called the Regenerative Communities Network. And we're really responding to some powerful trends. If we look at what the Stockholm Resilience Center identified 10 years ago around planetary boundary conditions, we're not doing very well. Uh, biogeochemical flows are pretty much in the red, meaning exceeded urgent action required. Obviously, with climate change, we're well into the yellow zone where we have X number of years to reverse course. Novel entities include uh, a variety of synthetic compounds. We have no way of knowing what harm they're doing throughout the biosphere. So the planetary boundaries give us a core way to think about resilience, thrivability. And we also need to think about our own species, our own health. And my good colleague, Kate Rayworth, developed what she calls donut economics. It's just a simple picture to say, if we look on the right, if we're going outside the edge of the donut, that means we're exceeding our ecological limits. We're exceeding those planetary boundaries. If we fall inside the donut, it means we're not meeting fundamental human needs. People are lacking in housing or water or food. They don't have a political voice and so forth. So how do you do both? That's the key design question. So this decade of design, of geodesign, that Glenn was talking about is really this effort to rapidly get us back in the heart of a donut economy. There are many, many ways to get there. It's an incredibly dynamic, exciting design challenge. We have to figure out how to do this at planetary scale, national scale, bioregional scale. And this is really the wealth of the world. If we think about biocultural diversity, you'll see that the darker regions are the areas of greatest plant diversity. And those uh, bright spots are human cultural groups. There's almost an exact correlation. Human diversity, linguistic diversity, cultural, ecological diversity all mesh together. And this is the kind of complexity that we need to address as we think about addressing planetary boundary conditions, and thriving. It's not one global approach. It's incredibly diverse. It has to respond to this incredibly rich biocultural context. So how do we get there? The Capital Institute, which hosts this Regenerative Communities Network, has articulated principles for a regenerative economy. And think sustainable plus resilient and almost a next iteration around regenerative, adding the notion that we're doing this work in a way that allows us to become deeper in our capabilities, more cooperative, aligned, uh, connected to each other. We're doing it in a way that does that for our teams, our organizations, our ecosystem of effort, that there's increasing sort of generosity of spirit, possibility, sharing, to make this happen quickly and equitably. And finally, regenerative means not just sort of breaking even, which sustainability has more or less come to mean, but rapidly, rapidly increasing the ecological health uh, all over the world and rapidly enhancing human well-being. Because it's already highly diminished and with the shocks and disruptions that we're facing, we desperately need to find ways to rapidly increase those levels. So a regenerative economy is deliberately designed to be conducive to life. They draw on 21st century science of living systems, not the 19th century science of thermodynamics, which undergirds conventional economics. They also draw on traditional ecological knowledge, ways of being from around the world. So it's a highly differentiated way of thinking about economics, the different bioregions, different biocultural Groups can have very different approaches to what ownership structures mean, transactional structures, flows of resources, that they can define those for themselves and create these incredibly rich platforms to interact with other bioculturally defined economies around the world. So really, we're talking about something distributed. It's mycelial, right? Think of a fungus in that mycelial network underneath. It's self-renewing, it's self-reflective, self-organizing and based on a reciprocity, 
between our species, one of 10 to 50 million different species. And I'm trained in mathematics, so I can't resist that this really is a shift from isolated functions that we use in, in conventional economics to really core ideas around autopoiesis, emergence, topology, networks of relationships. So we have to build a new science of economics that's based on those kinds of principles, which is how the world works in a mycelial way. And those are some of the principles that were articulated in a core 2015 paper by John Fullerton, a visionary president and founder of Capital Institute. So how do you begin to cultivate this regenerative world? How do you nourish it? What are the core conditions for it to thrive? Well, M Meg Wheatley is an extraordinary organizational development consultant. And when you're trying to sort of support something emergent, which regenerative economies are, you need to create these emergent networks. You need to even just start naming so that you can start to see each other and connect and nourish and illuminate. So we kind of threw up a flare and said, look, are there bioregions around the world? And by bioregion, I mean an ecologically and culturally coherent unit. It can be defined fairly flexibly, some mesh of ecoregions, watersheds, uh, urban settlement patterns, and fundamentally, a, a place that's small enough that you can really engage with it, care about it, and want to be part of a transformative process. So we kind of threw up this flare and said, okay, bioregions all over the world, is anybody on this path? Is anybody already engaged in these questions? Are there bioregions experiencing massive water scarcity, biodiversity loss, disruption, climate-forced migration? Well, it turns out that it's an unstoppable wave, that there are bioregions already engaged in this kind of transformative approach. They have many, many different ways to, to language it, uh, to tell stories about it, many practical ways that they're actually working with land, with regeneration, ownership patterns to make this happen. So there's this unbelievable diversity. And when you start to name it and see it, it can become one sort of deeply coherent uh, set of action. So the purpose of the RCN is to be a global action network designed to support transformation towards regenerative economies, as defined in a bottom-up, place-based way by bioregions around the world. So we provide kind of core support for these journeys. And we're, we're active in you know, Brazil, Costa Rica, Colombia, Mexico, uh, Himalayan mountains in Nepal, in the UK. We're active throughout North America, regions like Buffalo, Denver, San Francisco, Gulf of Maine, where Glenn's been active. The entire salmon nation, which is the the watersheds that salmon can get to on the Pacific coast of North America. And being an emergent network, we didn't quite know how the learning would occur. And so far, there are at least four different levels of learning where there's this deep uh, transformational process within each bioregion, the peer-to-peer -peer learning where you start to say, oh, we had no idea any other place in the world was trying to transform itself at a you know, regional to national scale. How do you even think about that? How do you map that? How do you work on that? So simply connecting and sharing these experiences has been really profound. Then we're trying to build out shared infrastructure for place-based regeneration. One of the core things, the tools, the processes that are needed over and over again that can be used very flexibly. And then finally, we actually thought this network was a totally insane idea, but why not try it? And then we realized that there are dozens of emergent networks that are the cousins to our network. This is an unstoppable wave of regeneration. Literally, in the last two or three years, at least 10 different global networks have sprung into being that deeply understand what we're doing, that allow us to interoperate and together work on these regenerative processes. So what is that shared infrastructure? You could name it a lot of different ways, but very roughly, there's a cycle that begins with nourishing the ground of leadership and education, that you can even begin 
to perceive whole systems, work from whole systems, geospatial analysis, geodesign is absolutely critical. If we had geodesign tools readily available to bioregions all around the world that would let them rapidly perceive how to work systemically, we could get there very quickly. It involves storytelling. And of course, there are wonderful uh, geospatial storytelling tools. It involves whole new kinds of communication and collaboration platforms, systems mapping and monitoring, okay, core to geospatial analysis, regenerative design and planning. So after cultivating this ground of the leadership, seeing from a systems perspective, creating a vision of a regenerative region that can function with the regenerative economy. You've got to design it, you've got to plan it, you've got to monitor and adapt. You need evaluation, you need blue marble evaluation, you need regenerative metrics. And finally, we're not just talking about theoretical exercises. Our nonprofit is called the Capital Institute because we're ultimately concerned with transforming capital so that capital can flow to regenerative projects. So how does this play out? Four years ago, Common Earth was um, given the designation as the implementation partner for the Commonwealth of Nations around regenerative development. So Commonwealth of Nations, 54 nations, 2.5 billion people. It has enormous convening power. If you can influence things throughout the Commonwealth, that's a model for the world. The Commonwealth is one third of all, all citizens of the world. So Common Earth is dedicated to regenerating the wealth of the Earth's commons. Here we are meeting in October uh, at Marlborough House in London, where the Commonwealth has been uh, administered for many decades. And we were talking very seriously about what regenerative development could mean at this Commonwealth scale. Well, we need models. So the Commonwealth has uh, requested Costa Rica, which is an incredibly active area within the Regenerative Communities Network, dozens of different bioregions, 28 recognized bioregions by the federal government in Costa Rica. The Commonwealth said, could you provide an inspiration for the nations of the Commonwealth to have a regenerative development roadmap at national scale? Well, that has to be built by a region up. The map on the left shows some of the key bioregions that already have enormous activity, two or three different biosphere reserves, uh, other smaller bioregions. And so we're developing a national road mapping process. Uh, Edward Muller is leading this work in Costa Rica. He's pioneered an extraordinary approach to doing uh, six layers of landscape analysis, all the traditional functional landscape layers, plus, plus society, economy, culture, politics, spirituality. So we have to roll that up, build that out bioregion by bioregion, roll that up to national strategies, and make sure that national incentives and resources flow back to support the bioregional efforts. And we think that's the beginning of a coherent national level approach. And by the way, when we talk about regeneration, we're talking about meeting the SDGs. That's just a given. But you're doing it in a completely holistic way, and you're questioning whether you'll ever reach the SDGs with a given level of system intervention. So if you're, if you're kicking the tires slightly, changing a few parameters, a few policies, you have to constantly ask, is there any conceivable way I will meet the SDGs or will I fail, just like all the other global targets like this have never been met for the last few decades? So when we say regeneration, we mean we constantly ask ourselves through a deep systems level evaluation process, could this coherently get us to meet our goals. So we're committed to a process that meets the SDGs, that gets us back within planetary boundaries, that allows us to thrive. And we'll never rest until we have truly viable pathways to get there. And it's incredibly difficult. We just cannot rest for a moment with our current ways of working, because they're not getting us there. So looking at a national level regenerative roadmap is a way to say, could this happen? Could we imagine a nation with a coherent strategy by, say, 2030 to be back with it, its fair share of planetary boundaries, meeting all um, conditions for human thriving and health? So that's what we're working on in Costa Rica with close collaboration uh, with Glenn's team and, and Blue Marble Evaluation. And to dive into the details, 
This is an absolutely extraordinary systems map created by the Osa Peninsula team. One small part of Costa Rica that holds actually 2.5% of global biodiversity. You don't need to understand the details, but understand what's happening here is that you're literally overlaying causal systems mapping. So some of the key arrows are showing what causes what within this bioregional system. You're overlaying key investment opportunities. You're overlaying key bioregional actors and potential investors. You're overlaying key potential projects that emerge from a completely grassroots, bottom-up planning process from a systems and transformation perspective. The team doing this work, led by Jennifer Menke and Joe Sway, Regenerative Earth and Omplexity, um, is doing breakthrough work with global significance. And as we curate this and share this throughout the RCN and other global networks, these are the kinds of things that we can learn together incredibly quickly. So for instance, this looks terrible. Any of you that have beautiful visual mapping tools that have a headache from looking at this, please talk to me, because we want to make this visual and intuitive and playful. This is just the behind the scenes. We've got to try to somehow map this out. 1,000 landscapes for 1 billion people. Extraordinary initiative led by eco-agriculture partners. UNDP is another partner, World Wildlife Fund, sustainable uh, finance laboratory, common land. Incredible vision to literally support 1,000 large-scale, bioregional scale landscapes around the world, particularly in vulnerable areas ecologically and or culturally, to support them with digital platforms that allow you to vision, model, govern, uh, and create support services. And the idea is you want to transition the landscape so that you're building out regenerative landscape investment portfolios. So using really deep geodesign work, you're identifying the key parcels within those landscapes that need to be phased with certain kinds of regeneration, certain kinds of investment transactional models over time and then building out a landscape regeneration fund. So RCN is the technical partner in this work to try to overlay how do you apply regenerative economics at landscape scale, what are the geospatial tools, and what are geospatial tools that actually connect with investors. So we want to get to investable projects. It's a decision support tool to influence where governments invest, private investors, large companies, uh, landowners in the region, philanthropies, that whole system. And this is just a, a very playful piece of software called Seven Vortex. We're exploring using this as a way to communicate across our bioregions throughout the RCN, to even communicate across different global action networks, developed by uh, Hugo Alvarez in uh, Colombia. And Seven Vortex, upper left, you can see that, that wild web um, if you zoom in on that, you would see you can have any kinds of uh, conceptual bubbles that have ecological relationships to each other. So Ugo designed this from a biomimicry perspective where the relationships have to be de defined in terms of are they uh, mutualism, are they mutually beneficial, are they symbiotic, are they predatory, are they neutral? So you literally create a conceptual map that's completely graph-based, it's semantic and ontological, it's visual thinking, and it's ecosystemic thinking. This is something that might be simple and flexible enough that different bioregions around the world could just easily, intuitively build workflows around it, understand what each other is doing. So just a, a very playful example of what we're up to. So I think that one role of geodesign is to warn us when we're going off the rails, when we're in danger of overstepping a regional or a national or a global tipping point. If our economic, our social, our cultural systems are driving us into the guardrails, geodesign can offer a viable and inspiring alternative pathway. And we can co-evolve our economies, our societies, and our cultures accordingly. Yesterday, Jack Dangermond spoke of a planetary nervous system, a system of systems. And one way to think about that is the biological internet. 
the mycelial fungal networks holding life together. We're all living beings, and we're all in a single connected matrix. I'd like to strongly echo Glenn Page's invitation to develop geodesign tools that support the regeneration of the planet. We will gratefully put them to work within the Regenerative Communities Network, within the Common Earth Alliance, throughout the Commonwealth, and now across the world, and within other emergent initiatives already growing unseen in the farthest reaches of the Earth. So we really, really welcome your participation. Come see me afterwards, talk to Glenn, and uh, really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much.